Some of you may not know, but, but we've, we've actually started some relationships, memorandums of, of, of understanding with uh, uh, two universities in, in China. Uh, and we're, we're talking to a couple more about possibly extending a memorandum of understanding with them to bring some Chinese students over here to study, to work on their master's degree, or certainly to get the education that they need to sit for the certified financial planner exam so that they can go back to China and practice as financial planners in that, in that country. Um, it's, it's, you know, I see it as a marriage between uh, two of the two of the industries in the U.S. to which we, have, we still have a comparative advantage in the world. Uh, one is education and one is financial services. And, and I, we woke up one day, and I, I should say we did, I woke up one day and realized that I'm right in the middle of, I'm married to those two industries and it would be an interesting thing to explore. Uh, and we had the opportunity, thanks to the work of, of uh, Ray Yao, who uh, got us invited to go over to Jinghua University and do a presentation back in 2009. We started to build these relationships. Um, but because of that, I, I, and I, I do this, and I talk about it, why part of because I think that the best way that we can build relationships and world peace is by working with people. Uh, and it, it, if you read the, the, the Art of War, uh, which is the Chinese will in the business manual, for the war manual, everything, you see that that's exactly what is being talked about in there as well. Uh, is how do you, you know, how do you win the war and win your, your philosophies with people is to work with them and, and, and to help them learn from, from us. And I will say that I, I, the people uh, that I meet on the ground uh, in China um, are every bit the capitalist, if not more so, than the average guy that I, guy and gal I see on the street here. I, I did a brief survey, and I, I'm taking your time, I'm sorry, but this, this is important to me. Um, I'm sorry. But what I, I did a small survey. I took my translator and did a walk around the block during, down in Beijing, and I was talking to these people that were washing windows and doing work and asking them why they work so hard. And the answer would always be, uh, it's my responsibility for my family. It is my responsibility to work hard for my country. And then it hit me after the third person answered in the same way, either they're being fed the line by somebody or maybe this is really true. And then I thought about how many people I would have to talk to on the streets of Columbia before I would get that answer once. And, and it, it's got a little frightening for me. You know, and, and it makes me pause to wonder. And I'm a huge fan of capitalism, absolutely. But I think that the people there are hungry to learn about what we're doing. Uh, two years ago, we had some speakers here from China that, that spoke after the 09 experience. They came in, in 10 to speak to us. And I remember asking them if they had the choice between a, a mutual fund called the Chinese Century Fund or the American Century Fund, and, and no, you know, so American Century, you just got a free plug. Uh, which would you choose? And they chose the American Century Fund, the speakers. I asked the question over in China, I get the same answer. Okay, so there's a lot of opportunity that I see for the U.S. in emerging markets. This is a long lead-in to say when I was in San Diego in October, I was looking at the program at the Financial Planners Association meeting. And on that program was, 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 a, was a presentation that was entitled Allocating to Emerging Market Equities, Why, How, Why, How and How Much by Margie Carpenter. So I walked into the presentation, sat down in the only seat I could find in an auditorium about the size of this. Uh, there's a lot of people go to the FPA meetings. Uh, and, and listened to the presentation, after which I went up and I asked Margie if she might come to the University of Missouri uh, later in, in April of next year and actually talk to a group of Missourians. And she was delighted to, in fact, do so. So let me tell you a little bit about Margie. Uh, Margie has over 25 years experience in the financial services industry, uh, 20 in the fee-only financial advisory profession, and in 2010 she launched her own company called Bell Tower Advisors, which is a fee-only financial advisory firm, independent firm, with, with a heavy emphasis, I, I believe from what I've read, is on, on, on women in, in terms of working with them as their financial planner, which I personally think is a great niche for a person to try to work in. Uh, she has also worked for large and mid-sized financial advisory firms where she actually worked as managing client investment portfolios from as, as small as $100,000 to as large as $15 million. 
Uh, she, she has done a lot of research. In fact, she, I think one of her great interests is, in fact, doing research, uh, maybe as much as it is working with talking to people. I, don't, I, you know, I really shouldn't say that about her, but it seems like that. She's, she, she's published in the Journal of Financial Planning and Financial Planning Magazine, so maybe some of you have actually read some of her work. Uh, she has presented her research, as I said, at the FPA member conference back in the fall of 2011. Uh, she is a CFP. Uh, she's also a certified investment management uh, analyst. She received her MBA from Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia, a BA from Bates College, uh, and she has taught uh, the principles of finance uh, at Strayer University, which I'm guessing might be in Ohio. Is that possibly right? I, I'm, that, I'm, it's news to me. I'm sorry. It was actually she worked at Harvard teaching. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <laughs> we'll just take it from there. Anyway, uh, she graciously, after I could get through her daughter to have a chance to talk to her after her presentation, she graciously agreed, to, let's see if we can work this out. So please join me in welcoming uh, Margie to our podium. Thank you very much, Rob. I appreciate that wonderful introduction. And yes, I did bring my 11-year-old daughter with me to San Diego when I gave this presentation at last, uh, last September, and that was a lot of fun. She gathered everyone's business cards that came up to me afterwards and said, Mom, here's another one. Mom, here's another one. Um, so what did you all think of the quiz? Did you all get 100% on the quiz? The purpose of the quiz was just to get you thinking a little bit about the subject matter. Um, you're, you know, being in academia, you're used to taking tests and quizzes, so I thought it was an appropriate way to start. Um, I'd like to start off by sharing the results of a poll that I took of the audience uh, when I gave this presentation out in San Diego. So the, the audience was made up primarily of financial advisors um, or folks who manage uh, money for wealthy individuals. So here are the questions I asked the audience. The first one was, how many of you in your equity allocations for client portfolios have a distinct allocation to emerging market equities that is separate from developed market equities? And I'd say about 95% of the people raised their hand. The second question was, how many of you have that allocation to emerging markets at 10% or less of equity assets? So a pretty small allocation. And about 25% of the people raised their hand. All right. Then I asked, how many of you have that allocation between 10 and 20% of equity assets? And the majority of the people raised their hand, about 75%. And then I asked if anyone had that allocation over 20% and maybe 5%. Just a few hands went up. So that's where we are today. Most advisors do have a, an, a distinct allocation to emerging markets. And a vast majority have, of them have that allocation at between 5 to 15% of equity assets. So just a little bit of housekeeping about what this presentation is and what it isn't. Today I'm going to talk about what I refer to as the extreme macro view, the really top-down and really long-term view for investing in what today we refer to as emerging markets. But I'm not going to spend much time on the shorter term or tactical issues like current valuations, the varying degrees of debt issues around the world, political issues. I know these are very important issues, but I'm, not, but I'm focusing on the long-term strategic opportunity because I think it is more important and we don't hear about it as much. Plus, I only have one hour. <laughs> Believe me, I am as aware as anyone of the fact that I'm only able to scratch the surface of this topic over the next hour. So here we have an upside down map of the world. Does anyone ever look at it this way? No, we don't. And because of that, when someone shows us an upside down map, you do a double take because you are so used to looking at it the other way all the time. 
But really, when you think about it, looking at it the other way is sort of arbitrary, isn't it? I mean, there's no top or bottom to the Earth. We're floating in space. So I put this here because it represents, for me, what I think we need to be doing in our allocation process and what I've tried to do in mine, and that is to look at the world through a different lens. The world is changing, and as you know, change is coming at us at increasing and even alarming speed. The pace of change is accelerating. For example, consider these milestones. It took the telephone 38 years to reach 50 million users. It took the television 13 years. The internet, four years. And Facebook, two years. Today, Facebook, I just read this a couple days ago, Facebook now has 900 million users worldwide, which is about 13% of the world's total population. How many people are on Facebook? Just about, just about everybody. Um, today, the landline telephone is pretty obsolete. People in China and India are going straight to cell phones, bypassing the landline altogether. They are leapfrogging us in this way because some of us are still tied to our landline. China has something like 900 million cell phones in use, where the U.S. has 300 million. Yes, their population is bigger than ours, but they are catching up to us on a percentage basis as well. I recently read that there are more total cell phones in use in emerging markets than there are in developed markets. So my point here is that when it comes to the future, it seems the only thing we can be sure of is that conventional wisdom will oftentimes just be wrong. It is simply that things that appear to be permanent at any given moment can change with stunning speed. This is the world we live in today. And to say it with a slightly different emphasis, it seems apparent that the United States is in a long-term slow decline as the world's superpower. We are a significant country, but our absolute dominance of the 20th century seems behind us. So today's discussion is about allocating our investment assets, our investment equity assets, to the higher growth regions of the world. And I've divided the talk into three three basic questions. The first one is why do we want to invest in emerging markets? Based on the research I've conducted, the reasons why we invested in emerging markets 10 or 20 or even 30 years ago are still intact, but they've simply become more prominent, more compelling. And I'll show you what I'm talking about. How we divide the world in our investment portfolios, separating emerging from developed international markets, I believe is outdated. And how much we allocate to these higher growth regions is also outdated, and I believe it is way too low. My solution, which for me satisfied all of these questions, is to reconstruct how we are allocating assets in our investment portfolios. It's not the only solution, but it's what makes sense to me right now, and I will share that with you later. We'll also look at how the product universe has changed over the last decade, and I think it will surprise you. So first we're going to look at how much we should be allocating. So how much, as, you, as we saw, uh, financial advisors are putting anywhere from 5 to 15 percent in uh, emerging markets, and I believe that's too low. And I'll show you in a few moments why I think that. But why is it possibly too low? Well, the past is our anchor. We started allocating to emerging market equities in the 80s and 90s when they were considered this new, obscure niche. And as emerging markets grew, our allocations grew, too, to their current 10, 15 percent of equity assets. We also have a home country bias. Interestingly, every country around the world has a home country bias. But as Americans in the past century, especially the, the last couple of decades, except for the 2000s perhaps, but having a home country bias has served us pretty well. Ours has been one of the strongest and deepest markets in the world over the latter part of the 20th century. But this is changing. 
herd mentality. Perhaps we just don't want to stray too far from what our colleagues are doing, and even the larger institutional money managers. I mean, those guys at Goldman Sachs, they're a pretty smart bunch, aren't they? Even if they only work with Muppets and not clients. But does this 10 to 20% make sense? We're going to look at where the wealth of the world is located today, along with the trends, as well as economic output and growth. And I think you'll see that this allocation is a little backward looking. So let's start by looking at the wealth of the world. And for our public equity markets, we look at market cap. Here we are looking at all publicly traded stocks around the world and their market values. And the total of all these values equals the market cap of the world. And unlike most of the data that I see on this, I wanted to go back really far. I wanted to go back to 1900 and see what it looked like then. So I found this study by the University of Tokyo, which estimated the market cap of the world in 1900 to be $18 billion. The US's share was a mere 16%. Europe had the dominant share at 56% with Great Britain, um, and Great Britain had 24%, and so on. You can read that. The US was simply a smaller, far less wealthy country back then. Some would even say that it was an emerging economy back in 1900, though the term didn't exist yet. The U.S.'s growth was phenomenal in the 20th century. By the 1970s, our share of world market cap had grown to more than 70% where it peaked. Now let's look at more recent world market cap data. We have 1985 on the left and 1995 on the right, these two pie charts. In 1985, the total market cap of the world was $2 trillion. The U.S. had a 66% share, and the rest of the world was 34%. Ten years later, in 1995, the market cap of the world was $15.6 trillion. The U.S.'s share was 55%, still dominant but declining. And by 1995, we had the rest of the world divided into two parts. We had developed international market, with a 42% share. And then we have this new term that refers to this new obscure niche, emerging markets, when they represented just 3% of total world market cap. So let's see what we have more, a little more recently. OK, at the end of 2010, the market cap of the world was $47 trillion. The US's share was 32%. Other developed markets, including Canada, were 33%. And then we have this obscure niche, which is now making up 28% of world market cap. So emerging markets went from a 3% share in 1995 to a 28% share in 2010, a 15-year time span. This next slide shows actual market cap of emerging markets next to developed markets for the years 2000 and 2010 on the left, and then shows their projected size for the years 2020 and 2030 on the right. So the blue bars represent emerging markets market cap in total dollars and the yellow bars represent developed markets market cap in total dollars. So for example, in 2020, which is the third set of bars, Goldman Sachs projects the market cap of all emerging markets combined will be $37 trillion, and developed markets will be $46 trillion. The total global market cap, they're projecting to be $83 trillion. Now going forward to 2030, they're projecting that the market cap of emerging markets will be greater than that of developed markets. They forecast emerging markets will be $80 trillion 
and developed markets will be $66 trillion for a total market cap of $146 trillion in 2030. Well, this is Goldman Sachs research. Um, the, que the question is how are countries being defined in these indexes? Uh, and there are countries that move from one index to the other. And I'm actually going to talk about that later on. Uh, that is actually a huge issue in, with this whole subject. Um, but my question here is are emerging markets still an obscure niche? Uh, these emerging countries are projected to not only catch up to us in about 10 years, but to overtake us in wealth in the next 20 years. Now this chart just shows more detail of the breakdown of the Goldman Sachs projection for the year 2030 when they estimate global market cap will be $146 trillion. The big move, of course, comes from China and Hong Kong, which together are projected to make up 29% of world market cap. The rest of the Asian region will make up 16%, so that all of Asia combined is projected to make up 45% of the world's publicly traded wealth. If Goldman Sachs is even a little bit close in their forecast, our world, our investment world, will be a vastly different place than it is today. Now, like many of you, I tend to be skeptical about forecasts for next year, let alone ones that go out decades. But I guess my point is that I think that the trends in their projections are what we need to pay attention to. I know that these numbers will never be exactly this, but the trends are pretty profound, and I'm paying attention to them. And just so you know, Goldman Sachs is not the only uh, group out there that is pretty bold in their forecasts. We also have Jeremy Siegel. Has everyone heard of Jeremy Siegel? Stocks for the long run, right? Uh, he believes there will be huge growth in emerging markets, and he is forecasting their share to be 67% by the year 2050. As a result of emerging markets' huge growth, the U.S.'s share will decrease to 17% by then, according to Jeremy Siegel. But 17%. Hey, that's where we were in 1900. 16%. So based on what we've just seen, here is, a, here is a chart showing the rise and fall of the U.S.'s share of world market cap over time, starting in 1900 and projecting out to 2050. It's a pretty striking visual of what's happened and is expected to continue to happen over this 150-year time period. Now, I will say that I'm aware that this chart is not drawn to scale, but again, it's the depiction of, of the numbers and over time that's still accurate. Now let's move on and look at economic size and growth. To look at economic output around the world, we look at GDP, gross domestic product. And this slide shows the total GDP for the world for the year 2010. A distinction about GDP, it includes public and private companies, as well as government expenditures. So it is all economic activity. Market cap, as we just went over, is the market value of all publicly traded companies. So because GDP is all economic output, it is more broadly encompassing. Stock investors are typically interested in profits, and GDP doesn't tell us anything about profits. But economic fundamentals and growth drive earnings growth, and earnings growth drives the stock market. So since you can't have profits without revenues, GDP and trends in GDP are important indi indicators. So for the, year 20, for the year 2010, the world's GDP was $60 trillion. The U.S.'s share was 24%. China had a slightly higher economic output than Japan, with almost 9% share, 
and so on. Now this is one specific year, and the total value of GDP output in dollars, so it doesn't tell us how the GDP number has grown or changed over time. So this slide looks at the trends in the growth of the world's GDP and also divides it by regions. So using IMF data from 2010, the left pie chart shows the actual or current composition of the world's GDP growth for the last 10 years. And the right pie chart shows the projected composition of growth for the next six years. So looking at the left pie chart, we see that the US, which is the light gray slice, if you can't read that, contributed 15% of the world's GDP growth over the last 10 years. China, in the red slice, contributed 23%. The rest of Asia also contributed 23%. So that all Asian countries combined contributed 46% of the world's GDP growth over the last 10 years. In the right pie chart now, the U.S. is projected to contribute 13% of the world's GDP growth over the next six years, while China is projected to contribute 29%. So that all of Asia, including China, is expected to contribute 53% of the world's GDP growth over the next six years. As a result of this growth, an analysis by Price Waterhouse projects that China will overtake the U.S. as the world's largest economy sometime around the year 2025. And while China gets much of the press coverage about its incredible economic growth, it is not the only country that is growing rapidly. According to the IMF, by the year 2015, there will be 17 economies with an annual GDP over $1 trillion, compared to only 10 today. The U.S.'s lead is disappearing. Now, this is a fun look at what our world would look like if our country's land masses were sized according to their GDP output. So the map on the left shows how big the countries were in 1990, according to their GDP then, while the map on the right shows how big they would be in 2050 if these GDP forecasts turn out to be correct. And you can see that most of the growth is expected to come from China, India, the rest of Asia, and Africa. World population growth. Now, I borrowed this graphic from The Economist magazine from a 2010 article titled, Another Year, Another Billion. And it shows the upward progression of the world's population starting in the year 1800 and moving clockwise until you get to the projected population in the year 2050. So this is a 250 year period. So I just want to give you a few milestones here. In the year 1800, there were one billion people on Earth. 100 years later, in 1900, there were 1.7 billion people on Earth. So our planet's population grew by 70%. But in the 20th century, our planet's population almost quadrupled. We went from 1.7 billion people to over 6 billion people by the year 2000. So the Earth added 4.4 billion people in that century. Just last October 31st, you may remember, there was a lot of press that uh, they were claiming that we just surpassed 7 billion people last October. Now, the UN expects that by the year 2050, there will be 9 billion people inhabiting our planet. So you can see that the rate of growth is accelerating. Now, the UN projects that that growth will slow after 2050, and the planet won't reach 10 billion people until the year 
2,183. I, I thought that was kind of a funny year. I wonder if they have the date and the time picked out too. But what I found notable in all this data is that only 5% of the world's population lives in the USA. Our population is around 313 million right now. And that by the year 2050, it is projected that 80% of our planet's population will live in Asia and Africa. Now to think of the implications of this growth for us and our planet, from land usage resource usage and depletion, to feeding, housing, and caring for these billions and billions of people is truly mind-boggling. But what are some of the investment implications? To think about this, I think we need to look at what is happening to these billions of people around the world. What kinds of lives will they be living? What will they be doing? And how will they be living? And to answer that question, I think we need to look at some of the macro human trends taking place around the world by our growing population. Now this list up here is not all encompassing, but is focused more on those areas that are critical from an investment standpoint and that lead to growth in capitalism around the world. And that's what's changing at great speed. Other countries are adopting capitalism and are catching up to us in this way. And some of the things that took us decades to accomplish will take far less time for the rest of the world because they are leapfrogging us in terms of these new technologies. And they are hungry. And we in the US are in a slow relative decline. Now there's a couple of books, there's actually many books that have been published in the last several years about these topics, but a couple I would just want to point out. Uh, one book that was published last year is called that used to be us. Has anybody heard of it or read it? Um, it's subtitled, How America Fell Behind in the World It Invented and How We Can Come Back. What the authors claim is that we have lost our ambition and our drive. And as a nation, we are not a healthy country, economically or politically. And the rest of the world is catching up because they are more motivated. The authors go on to outline the causes and what they believe are the solutions, but as a country, we have a very big challenge ahead of us. Another book that I just read about in last week's Wall Street Journal is called Reverse Innovation, a book that offers insights into the quickly changing dynamics of the global economy. Now, this book suggests that the traditional flow of innovation from rich to poor countries is now moving in reverse. If economic growth is being driven by developing and emerging markets, then innovation almost certainly will be as well. Now what's happening in each of these areas could by themselves make up an entire presentation. There is just so much going on in each area. So I'm only gonna give you a few highlights. Demographics. The median age of people in the developed world is 40 years old. In the emerging world, it's 30 years old. That's quite a difference and has huge implications for countries in terms of its human capital, which is arguably the most important resource for any country. Due to their younger populations, emerging markets are in a better position since they'll have more potential workers relative to dependent children and retirees. Education. China and India have been pouring resources into education, and today, China graduates over five million people from college every year, while India graduates three million. In contrast, the US has about 1.6 million college graduates every year. And there was an article that I saw in last year's uh, Wall Street Journal called SAT Reading and Writing Scores Hit a Low. And I'm just going to read a couple of passages here. SAT scores for the high school graduating class of 2011 fell in all three subject areas and were the lowest ever recording according to data released on such and such a date, which is this was last September. At the precise time that the importance of a college degree is increasing, the ability of the U.S. to compete in a global economy is decreasing. 
So you can see that the, some of these other countries are catching up to us in terms of education as well. Entrepreneurialism. It is spreading rapidly. In China, for example, SMEs, which are small and mid-sized enterprises, have become the dominant growth driver in their economy. In 2010, they accounted for 60% of GDP and 80% of employment in urban areas. Capital flows. Foreign direct investment has been steadily increasing to emerging markets. But it is not just investment dollars moving into publicly traded stocks, but also private equity is flowing to these markets as well. According to the Institute of International Finance, private capital flows to emerging economies were over 800 billion in 2010, which was a 38% increase over the prior year. And they are expected to get even bigger. As far as IPOs go, here is a very interesting chart showing the ratio of recent IPOs to total market cap in several Asian economies compared to the US on the bottom. So Hong Kong seems to be the place to list your new company. A recent article in Business Week stated that a Hong Kong listing is a no-brainer because the growth prospects for these businesses in Asia are their future. A Hong Kong listing raises the profile of all suppliers and customers in Asia. Some companies that recently listed their, their shares on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange are Prada, Coach, and Samsonite, all household names. The U.S. exchanges are just not as popular as they once were because our listing costs and requirements are more stringent. So are we capturing this IPO growth in our asset allocations? Apparently not. Now here is yet more evidence of the changing patterns of wealth around the world, the Forbes annual listing of the world's billionaires. Now instead of going over all of these numbers, I'm just going to point out that the ranks of Asia, South America, and the Middle East and Africa are growing much faster than our own. So the third line down, the Asia Pacific region, for example, has 332 billionaires with a total combined wealth of almost $1 trillion, which represents an increase of 37% over the previous year. Now I want to share some world stock market facts. According to the S&P, there are 210 markets, countries with stock markets. Granted, a lot of these countries are too small to be included in our popular indexes, but many are growing. At the end of 2009, there were 48,751 listed stocks worldwide. Now, this does not include stocks traded on the pink sheets but only 9% of these stocks are on the U.S. exchanges. Then there are 25 stock markets that have an average company size of $1 billion or more. 10 of these stock markets are in emerging markets. Now the information on this slide clearly challenges the conventional wisdom that investors get plenty of exposure to this international and emerging market growth by investing in US-based multinational companies. Yet 90% of the world's listed stocks are found outside the US, as well as 70% of the world's wealth that we saw previously. So do we really mean to miss out on this growth? Now let's look back at the equity allocations for a couple of different groups today. Starting with financial advisors, and I shared with you their allocations earlier. Um, many of us, I'm a financial advisor, many of us are dividing our equity allocations into 65% domestic or US-based equities, 35% international. And of this 35%, many of us are putting 10% in emerging markets, 25% in developed markets. 
Now, if we follow the MSCI benchmarks in these allocations, this 10% in emerging markets gives you about a 2.6% exposure to China and Hong Kong, and about 3% if you include India. Some institutional managers, which would include companies like Fidelity and Vanguard and private asset management firms, have about a 6% allocation to emerging markets, even less than financial advisors. And you can see what some other well-known firms are doing here as well. Now, I got this information from a Barron's, uh, a Barron's article from last year. JP Morgan seems to have the highest allocation to emerging markets at about 19%. But as we have just seen, emerging markets makes up about 28% of global market cap, along with all the evidence that this number is only going to go up. Now, this chart provides a drill down to the financial advisor's allocation on the previous slide. So this shows how the 35% international allocation looks from a regional and country perspective. So on the left, we have the MSCI EFA index showing its current country breakdown. And on the right, we have, or in the middle, we have the MSCI Emerging Markets Index showing its country breakdown. Then to the very right of the charts, you have a calculation for that advisor's portfolio having the 35% international allocation. So you'd have about 14% exposure to all Asian countries versus Asia actually capturing 30% of world market cap and 53% of the growth in the world's GDP. In fact, with this allocation, you'd have a higher exposure to Japan than you do to China and Hong Kong. So what do we do with this information? One solution is to simply increase our allocations to emerging markets. But before we do that, I'd like to talk about how we divide the world, how we're dividing the world's equity markets. And I happen to think that how we divide the world today is really outdated. The way we separate emerging markets from developed markets has seen better days. So when I really looked at these definitions and tried to make sense of them, I found that there was a lack of consistency in how some countries were being defined and categorized by different investment firms and our benchmark providers. They all look at it and define it somewhat differently. So I got really confused. And so my first question was, just what is an emerging market? Where did the term come from, and how are we using it today? All right, the term was developed in 1981 by Antoine Van Actmail, who was an investment officer with the International Finance Corp. Before this, we called them third world countries. The term emerging markets became popular in the 80s and seemed to capture what was needed at the time. Here was this obscure niche, but it was growing, so we had to think about it in our allocation process. His definition was pretty straightforward. Countries with an income per capita of $10,000 or less. Poor countries, basically, very poor. And its intended use back then was to introduce or reintroduce this obscure niche to the international investment world. ActMail knew that invest investors would not be very excited about investing in third world countries, and he was putting a new fund together. So what is the definition today? I wish I could tell you that there is one definition that is widely accepted, but there doesn't seem to be any agreement on what it is. Our benchmark providers and investment firms that we look to for guidance on all of this they all seem to have their own variation of the definition. And they are all far more complicated today with a lot of subjective criteria and many more factors, not just income per capita. There is no industry agreement. But the one criteria that still seems to prevail that is included in all these definitions is the income per capita part. So the threshold today has been raised to about $15,000, which is what MSCI uses. So I just wanted to look at some countries based on this one criteria. 
and I was confused by several countries' placement. In the interest of time, I'm not going to go over all of the things that confuse me about all of these countries listed here, but I will talk about China because it's really an interesting one. China, as you know, is considered an emerging market. According to the income per capita criteria, it probably should be. Because on average, it is a very poor country. But some cities inside China are on average very wealthy. In fact, after the US and Japan, China ranks third in the number of millionaire households. China has 1.1 million millionaire households. So the country as a whole is an emerging market from the income perspective, but some cities and citizens are not. So the question is, or at least a question, is how are we segmenting this country? And as China's wealth grows, which it obviously is, when and how does it make the transition to developed market status? What are the implications for that? What happens to our indexes when that happens? Will they sell all of the Chinese stocks out of the emerging markets index and buy them back simultaneously in the developed markets index? And what will happen to all the mutual funds that are investing this way? China's increasing importance in our global economy really makes me question how much longer we can define it as emerging. As the second largest economy in the world, doesn't that qualify it as emerged? These other countries all have something that makes me question why it is placed where it is currently placed. But basically the methodology has become way too complicated. MSCI classifies 75 countries in their three widely used indexes, IFA, EM, and Frontier. But there are 210 stock markets around the world, so it seems these indexes will continue to evolve and change. I know that the EM index had 26 countries a few years ago, so some countries were promoted and one or two was demoted. Then we have all these monikers. We have BRIC, we have BRIIC, we have BRICS, BRICS, we have PIGS, CIVETS. Uh, another one that I just read about was CARBS. I mean, who can keep up with all these? Uh, where does the slicing and dicing end? Is there another way to look at and divide the investable markets of the world? After looking around, I found other firms that were dividing the world on a regional basis. And this is what I'm doing now. I think it makes sense to me. It may not make sense to me forever, but right now it makes sense. What I do is I establish a baseline or a neutral reference point, which is the regional division of market cap around the world. And that regional division is up here in blue. So the blue percentages are the neutral reference point, and this is an, uh, is an objective number. To arrive at my target allocation, which is in green, uh, BTA stands for Bell Tower Advisors, I take the subjective side into consideration. This is where I tweak it. What I know about the trends taking place around the world and my own beliefs about these trends, about how these trends may play out. So number one, I do have a slight home country bias. So I have increased my America's allocation from 40 to 45%. Number two, I do wanna stay ahead of the strong growth in Asia. I do believe that Asia is gonna continue to have very strong growth. And I want to stay a little bit ahead of that, so I've increased that to 32%. I've reduced the European allocation to make up for this, and then I have a small allocation to the Middle East and Africa. But with this methodology, I have a concrete process for determining my target asset allocation. I'm not just inching my emerging markets exposure upwards, because this obscure niche is still growing. I start with the actual world market cap, which is objective, and then I add my own subjective analysis to it. And this is not hard to implement, 
there are a lot of ETFs and mutual funds that can be used to invest on a regional basis. Now, this chart then is the exact same data that I showed back in slide number seven, but instead of being divided between emerging and developed markets, this is divided regionally. So this right here is my neutral reference point. I'm almost done here. Um, what about risk? I realize that some of us have this embedded belief that emerging markets are somehow riskier than the rest of the world, so I need to say something about risk. And there are many ways to think about risk. There are different kinds of risk, financial risk, market risk, interest rate risk, pure volatility. But I read an article not long ago which summed it all up pretty well, and the article was called, Up is Down and Safe is Risky. And the author made a list of what used to be safe before the market crash of 2008, and he reminded us what happened to those assets, and then he made a list of what used to be safe and what happened to those assets. So if you look at the list of what used to be safe, our assumptions just turned out to be wrong. No one questioned once upon a time that all of these assets were safe. Right? But the market crash threw all that thinking out the window. The volatility in the market that we've, we've experienced the last several years is at least partly attributable to investors reevaluating what is safe and what is risky. If you look strictly at historical standard deviation, you will likely conclude that emerging markets is one of the riskiest asset classes out there. But if you take a more forward-thinking approach, you'll realize that emerging markets are not what they once were. Many countries that are today identified as emerging markets are enjoying an unprecedented period of financial strength and stability, while most of the developed world struggles with our debt-related chaos. It's an interesting role reversal. Now, the last thing I want to leave you with is a look at how our fund universe has changed over the last decade. On the left, we have 2001, and in that year, there was $18 billion invested in emerging market mutual funds and ETFs. Of the 160 funds in existence then, 67 of them are no longer around. In 2012, which was just, I got this data just earlier this year, there is now $326 billion in assets in these funds, and there are 390 different funds. Assets in mutual funds are almost roughly equal to those in exchange-traded funds, ETFs. Now, the two largest funds in this category, which are both ETFs, the Vanguard Emerging Markets Index, which was launched in 2005, not long ago, and the iShares Emerging Markets Index, which was launched in 2003, still not long ago, together today account for 30% of all assets in this category. And these two funds both track the MSCI Emerging Markets Index. So my question is, what's gonna to happen to these exchange-traded funds when the MSCI decides that China and some of these other big countries are no longer appropriate for the Emerging Markets Index. Some of the conclusions that I have come up with, I think are up here on this slide. I do think that this subject is ripe for continued change and discussion. And I do think that some of these terms, certainly some of these monikers are not gonna stick. Developing nations' growth will continue to influence our wealth shifts around the world. Our U.S. dominance is declining. We need to seriously think about and reduce our own home country bias from its current 70 or 80 percent down to a more reasonable level if we want to capture the growth around the world. And we must continue to rethink our allocation strategies. Thank you very much for your time. I really enjoyed being here. I hope I've given you some food for thought. 
And I would be interested in talking to anyone afterwards uh, about their, their thoughts about some of my, uh, my comments. Thank you very much. Do we have time? What allocation in developing countries do you use or do you believe is correct? What allocation in developing yes. countries? Well, I no longer invest that way. Okay. I invest on a regional basis now, so I'm capturing, I'm capturing the emerging market's growth through the regional allocation. So I have uh, you know, 32%, I have a 32% allocation to Asian countries, which includes both, you know, includes Japan, includes Australia, and includes those countries that are identified as emerging, China, India, Malaysia, et cetera. Yes? I don't, I don't recall that, that the article itself commented on that, but I would think that um, pension funds take such a risk-averse, very risk-averse approach. So they're looking at emerging markets as too risky, which I think is the wrong approach today. My Anything turn. else? Got a question right oh, uh, answers to the quiz are on the back of the page. I have, a different, I have a different kind of question. Yes. Uh, you've talked about population growth. Um, I've been interested in the uh, problems caused by depopulation in, uh, in Europe. And if I'm not mistaken, I think the population of China is expected to start to decline in about five years. Uh, as, and it seems to me, as if you're looking at trends, mm -hmm. that's a very important trend. Mm -hmm. um, I have seen some of that data about China um, due to their one-child policy, um, and I think it's a, you know, it, it could be a, a problem for them, just like what we're experiencing in our country. You know, I, I pointed out that emerging markets have a lower average age than developed markets, but China doesn't fall into that category for emerging markets. China, I think, has an average age that's close to ours. I don't remember the exact number, um, but China could have some of those issues related to not having enough younger people supporting the older people in their retirement years, just exactly what we're going through. And Japan, too. Yes. Yes, correct. Yes, the, the, the data that I come up with is you can pick it apart. There are, there, there is so much data out there, and it's changing every day. Um, so some of the conclusions that I've come up with, you know, are for me, and, and they work for me, but they're, this stuff is constantly evolving and changing. So it's hard to stay on top of it, but we've got to try. So. Anything else? Thank, thank you. <laughs>